So let's unpack these. We have the creation mandate. Genesis 1, back going back there. In 1, 26 and 20 to 28, 126, the Lord, then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule or have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move in the ground. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The first thing we see here is let them have dominion. Let them rule. Let them exercise skilled mastery. What Lynn White criticized, what Arnold Toynbee criticized, and others as well, is what they call dominion theology. It says humans have dominion over creation, they can use it however they want. But the idea of this word is exercising skilled mastery, not just using up all the resources that you can. Second, well this has a strong connection by the way to the image of God because Theologians have, always, have long debated, what do we mean by the image of God? There are those who say, well, man is tripartite, body, soul, and spirit, because God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's at least one verse in Paul that tends to indicate that. But then Jesus said, uh, love your God with all your soul, mind, body, soul, mind, and strength. That's four things. So maybe we're quadripartite. Um, <laughs> It's just not easy to come up with a biblical division that way. I think we're dualistic. We have an immaterial part and a material part. So that doesn't seem to work. Um, others have said that being made in the image of God is being made with rationality. It's almost impossible to define what rationality means. How about speech? I saw an amazing, an amazing show the other night on, on Nova about a dog, a, a, a border collie, that had a vocabulary of a thousand words. Did you see that? You saw that, Jerry. The, the, this, this guy, a psychologist, um, had this huge pile of dog toys, and he named them all, and he taught the names to the dog. So here was this huge pile of toys, and the reporter at random Decide, he had the list of the names. And so he, he said to the dog, I can't remember the dog's name, you know, Casey? Could be? Yeah. Casey, find Krabby. Casey goes and paws through this and picks up Krabby and brings it back. And sure enough, that's it. And, and then they did an amazing thing. Uh, he put about six or seven toys out, all of which were named. And then he got one dog toy that the dog had never seen and put it there. And what was the name of that one, do you remember? I don't remember. Okay, uh, let's call it Skunk. And, and uh, he said, uh, Casey, find Skunk. And so Casey looks and he can't, you know, he doesn't know what he's looking for. And he goes to the pile and he runs back and, and, and find Skunk, find Skunk. And finally, the dog by process of elimination says, Skunk must be the one that I don't know the name of. And he picks it up and carries it to him. Isn't that incredible? That's astonishing. And of course we know that there are gorillas that can have a three or four hundred word vocabulary in sign language. How do we draw the... It, it doesn't seem to me that this is quite what we need to do to distinguish the image of God from, from not... Clearly there's a distinction. I mean, even Casey can't talk about the metaphysics of material objects or uh, the nature of, of eschatology in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. But he's got an awful lot going for him in the way of intelligence. So others have said the image of God, Karl Barth said, it's human sexuality. 
just as God is interpersonal, when we're, he's told in the image of God, he made them male and female, he created them, different but able to relate. And that, there's something there, but that's not sufficient, I don't think. At least it seems to me that in context, God said, let us make him in our image and let him have dominion. The ability to rule, to exercise skilled mastery, must have something to do with the image of God, whatever else is there. Psalm 115, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. This is a task he's given to us, a task of having dominion, of exercising stewardship. Then in, in verse 28, fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, the Hebrew word kabash, this is a very harsh word, uh, to bring into submission. It's used of the Israelites uh, bringing into submission uh, the Canaanites in Palestine or in Nehemiah 5.5 of, of forced servitude. And in Esther 7.8, this word kabash is even used uh, for, for rape. It's a harsh word. Why would this be given as part of the creation mandate? How about rule? This is not quite as harsh, but this is also a strong word to dominate. Um, the cognate word in, in Arabic and Akkadian is used for treading grapes, stomping down. Why these strong words have dominion by subduing and ruling? Especially when we realize that this command was given before the curse. Well, I think there's two considerations that we ought to bring to bear on this. One is theological, one exegetical. Exegetically, we look at the immediate context and we say that God placed us in a position to have dominion, and the way we have dominion is when necessary, taking the strong measures to extend God's dominion in a world where that dominion was not yet obvious. God is sovereign, there's no doubt about that. It's not that the world is out of control, but just as in chap the early part of chapter one, God brought order out of chaos, there is still a measure of chaos in the world, and part of having dominion, the royal duty, is to bring order out of chaos. And that demands decisive and at times strong action. This is a delegated royal duty, bringing order out of chaos in the world. But we also note that this is the second consideration. Uh, when we come into chapter 2, and uh, the end of chapter 2, and beginning of chapter 3, Satan is already there. The snake is already in the garden. Satan has already rebelled against God before the fall of Adam and Eve. And evil needs to be confronted, restrained, and driven out. And that effort is a royal duty that demands strong action. But then there's the Edenic mandate. By the way, these, these terms, creation mandate, Edenic mandate, um, different theologians have different terms that they use here. Some will talk about the cultural mandate, you may have heard that, uh, and the mission mandate. There's no fixed categories. Uh, these are categories that are not uncommon, but you may have heard other terminology used, and that's okay. The Edenic mandate we find in Genesis 2.15, and the, this is the priestly duties. In, uh, in uh, two here, God has planted the Garden of Eden, and in 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. The word for work is avad, 
the Hebrew, Hebrew word uh, for work is ebed. Avad is, is the verb. Um, but this is also the same word used for serving. It, it's used for, for a servant, the root word for servant. And it's also the word used for worship. Serve the Lord your God has in the Old Testament the connotation of worship the Lord your God. And then the second word is to keep it, shamar. Shamar is to hear, but not just to hear the noise, to hear and obey, to observe, but also to guard to exercise care over, to preserve. This is a word with a broad semantic range. And some of the earlier translations said God put Adam in the, in the garden uh, to tend it and to till it. So his, his role was purely agricultural. But in light of what we've seen about the progress of the kingdom of God, the presence of evil, and so on, there's much more here than merely the agricultural mandate. And then we notice that these same two words, Abad and Shamar, are used of the priests in Numbers uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Um, the Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi, I present them to Aaron. They're to perform duties for him and the whole community that attend a meeting, doing the work of Ad, the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings, um, fulfilling all their obligations. That is, they are to guard, take care of, guard. This is part of the priestly function. And in 18.7 of Numbers, um, here the Lord is speaking to Aaron and, and his, his, his priests. But only you and your sons, Aaron, may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Service, Abad. Anyone who comes near the sanctuary must be put to death. You are to guard the sanctuary. This is a priestly aspect of the function. A delegated priestly duty to guard creation. Now, what normally comes to your mind when you think of the Old Testament priests? What did they do? Sacrifice. Did the sacrifices. Oops. I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. John Walton says, the tasks given to Adam are of a priestly nature, that is, caring for sacred space. In ancient thinking, caring for sacred space was a way of upholding creation. This is in his commentary on Genesis. Now, the function of the priest in the Old Testament was not to teach. That was the Levite's job. The priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. And the rest of the Levites were to teach. The priests had a much more restricted set of duties to lead and to perform the worship ceremonies, the sacrifices, the singing, and so on, and to guard the purity of the sacred space, to keep it ceremonially clean to keep it pure. And so if God is giving to Adam by putting him in the garden priestly duties in addition to his royal duties, you're to take the kingdom and advance the kingdom using the might that's necessary to do that, but you are to do it as a priestly act, an act of worship, an act of guarding the purity of God's world. There, there's a lot of, of layers of of meaning in, in these two mandates. Why the creation and the Edenic mandate? Well, first of all, Satan was in the garden before the fall. Even if Eve, Eve had not listened, Satan's still there, and evil needs to be resisted and driven out. Second, gardens need tending, cultivating working. Adam was given meaningful work in the garden before the fall, before the curse on the ground, because gardens need tending. Even the Garden of Eden 
would have reverted to its natural state without care. And if that garden is a symbol of the sanctuary and the role of humanity is to extend the sanctuary to, in the sense of extending the kingdom, extend the garden, that's going to take work. Certainly the second law of thermodynamics was active. I, I disagree here with some younger creationists who think that the second law wasn't instituted until the fall, but life itself depends upon the second law. Um, the nuclear fusion of the sun that provides light and heat depends upon the second law. Uh, clearly, the second law came into being when God created the earth. And many of the systems on the earth have a, have a character that is called a chaos system. It, it's, a, it's a system that has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. If the initial conditions vary very slightly, the result will be dramatically different. The simplest example, think of those days as a kid when you'd balance a broom on your hand. And you start out, the broom is pretty stable. You get it balanced, and, but pretty soon the air currents move it and you've got a little bit of motion in your hand and, and pretty soon you're moving it around and pretty soon it's falling over, right? The slightest change in the initial conditions produces dramatic changes in the end result. And many, many natural systems have this characteristic. They're called dynamical dissipative systems with sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The classic definition of a chaos system. And those kinds of systems need management so that the initial conditions are not pushed beyond the equilibrium point. So the creation mandate and the Edenic mandate have to do not just with preaching the gospel, but with maintaining the created order as well. You with me? And this is an act, a royal act as God's vice regents and a priestly act of worship. This confers great dignity on our work in the world. Now, not all work in the world is dignified. Not all work is worth doing. And some people have to do rather menial and meaningless tasks just to survive. But God values our work. And if we're content making bumper stickers that say excrement occurs, <laughs> although that's not quite what they say, <laughs> there's something wrong with our approach to work. Our work matters to God. He's given us the dignity of working in a way that makes a difference in the world. And our work is worship. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.